Well, it's always the balance between security and civil liberties. Um, you know, how far um, do we want to allow the government to go to ensure our safety, uh, while at the same time making sure that uh, these efforts are not going to infringe on our civil liberties. Hello and welcome to Insights from Abroad. This podcast is part of the Middle East and South Asia Initiative in the College of Sciences at the University of Central Florida. My name is Leah Jusafe. Our mission here is to educate, engage, and to influence the international community. Today, I am joined by Dr. Ted Reynolds to discuss some topics surrounding our Middle East series. Dr. Reynolds, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. So that listeners are aware, Dr. Ted Reynolds is the Director of the Terrorism Studies Program for the Office of the Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. His work focuses on understanding terrorist and extremist radicalization within social media and other online communications. Dr. Reynolds also serves as a subject matter expert in these fields. Additionally, he is a professor at the University of Central Florida, teaching classes in terrorism studies, national security, and the intelligence community, and cyber warfare policy. Dr. Reynolds received a BA in International Affairs from Rollins College, an MA in Political Science from UCF, and a PhD in International Relations from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. I'm going to jump right into the questions here. About a month ago, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was eliminated by a U.S. military mission. In what ways do you think the death of al-Baghdadi will affect ISIS? Well, so far it's um, had a a big impact because now they're, Baghdadi was was removed from the battlefield as well as his number two. Mm -hmm. So now picking a new leader has been the priority for ISIS. They have done that. how long that individual stays in in the theater will be interesting to see, but what we see now is a competition for those ISIS members now that Baghdadi's gone, now that they've been removed from their safe haven in Iraq, and so what you see is is other groups now trying to uh, lure some of those ISIS members away from ISIS, particularly Al-Qaeda, backed into what they consider to be uh, the true mission. Many counterterrorism professionals have expressed the belief that the death of al-Baghdadi will not cripple ISIS. This stands in stark contrast to the death of Osama bin Laden and how it severely damaged the operations of al-Qaeda. Why do you think this is the case? Well, first off, um, al-Qaeda was weakened but not destroyed. Um, Zawahidi, who is the main ideological leader of of al-Qaeda, was still alive and still is alive. So uh, he has been um, kind of the rock for Al-Qaeda, keeping them in the playing field. They have still been able to do attacks uh, in the region. Uh, Removing Baghdadi has created a a leadership vacuum that they're trying to fill. And now the other groups, the affiliates of ISIS, um, are slowly starting to, um, you know, express their uh, allegiance to the new leader of ISIS. Um, Again, it's going to be interesting to see how long uh, he sticks around. Uh, But the other main question is, uh, are they going to be able to remain operational uh, throughout this transition? Uh, You know, is is there still money to do their operations? And where are their people going? ISIS and Al-Qaeda have many similarities, including them both developing from civil wars and foreign occupations in the Muslim lands. Could you elaborate on some more similarities these groups have? Well, they share a a similar ideology. They're both um, Salafist groups, Sunni uh, sect of of Islam. Um, ISIS, however, was much more violent than Al-Qaeda. As a matter of fact, uh, Al-Qaeda admonished ISIS for their level of violence and we all remember you know the beheadings and the emulations and things like this uh, so but, but they do share an ideology which is to um, spread their ideology around the world um, 
and through violence. And they're terrorists, so they, they express their ideology through violence. Uh, so they have that similarity. Uh, but the difference is um, Al-Qaeda has a much broader idea of spreading their ideology um, and not as violent because they feel like that violence is counterproductive. ISIS, on the other hand, has no trouble with violence and in the regions where they are, the ex extermination of people that don't share their ideology. And we've seen this with their um, s s almost genocide of the Yazidi people and, and then their enslavement of the Yazidi women and children. You already began to go into this, but ISIS and other terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda have many differences, like their goals, specific origin, and recruitment strategies. Could you elaborate a little more about some notable differences between them? Most notably is the, the way that ISIS has held, held territory previously. Uh, they tried to become a state. Al-Qaeda never had that aspiration. Al-Qaeda was a movement uh, and look to spread their ideology um, you know, through that uh, movement. Um, ISIS tried to establish a state um, and what they called the caliphate. And this goes back to uh, some writings uh, from uh, the early 1900s uh, of an individual uh, named Said Tutub who called for a vanguard to uh, eventually overthrow what he deemed to be apostate regimes, non-believers. Uh, and bring about a new caliphate. So when Baghdadi, you know, announced the establishment of the caliphate in, in Iraq and called himself the new caliph, that was, in many people's view, uh, fulfillment of a prophecy. So, and Al-Qaeda never had those aspirations. So that was one of the draws to um, ISIS, was people felt uh, this was an opportunity to rebuild what they saw was the ancient caliphate. Um, and that did not turn out to be true. In general cases and all around the world, how does political unrest lead to terrorism? It really depends on the group and what their goals are. Uh, some groups try to, even though they have political unrest, they're trying to resolve their issues through legitimate forms of redress, okay, Polit you know, through political means, and even though they might become uh, unsettled and even violent, uh, they don't engage in what we would call terrorism. And there is a big difference between turning over some cars and setting off bombs, okay? Both are considered political unrest, but one is considered terrorism, the other is not. Um, and oftentimes what you see is when groups reach a point where they feel like they've extinguished all avenues of redress through political means, and they feel like they still need to continue, then they might turn to terrorism to try to ob achieve their objective, okay? Bring about political change. And really, at the end of the day, that's what terrorism uh, tries to accomplish, is to convince the public to put pressure on the government to change their policies toward the ideas of the terrorist group, whatever they do. You know, we have many different terrorist groups, left wing, right wing, religious, single issue, uh, even groups like the Animal Liberation Front or the Earth Liberation Front are considered terrorist groups. We have anti-abortion terrorist groups, okay? So, you know, too often today, given the situation with 9-11 and following that, people tend to look through a, a very narrow uh, view of what terrorism is and think it's all about jihadi terrorism, and it's not. There are many, many different terrorist groups, and as a matter of fact, almost every major religion in the world has a terrorist group affiliated with it. After 9-11, the definition of civil liberties changed drastically because of new legislation like the Patriot Act. What are some ethical issues inherent in the fight against terror? Well, it's always the balance between security and civil liberties. Um, you know, how far uh, do we want to allow the government to go to ensure our safety, uh, while at the same time making sure that uh, these efforts are not going to infringe on our civil liberties. So the monitoring of communications. Um, so, it, you know, is it possible to monitor all electronic communications, emails, texts, all of that? You bet. But the law says that we can't. The government, our government can't. Okay. So, um, and this is a field where I work, and so often the discussion is, yeah, we can com monitor these uh, terrorist communications, but what happens when there's an American in the loop? 
well, to monitor their communications would be violating the civil liberties. So, and, and even when, you know, we are monitoring communications overseas, we have to be very careful. Let's say we have somebody living overseas and they call home to speak to their spouse or their children or some other family member. Well, we can't monitor that communication because that's an American. So we have capabilities, but we also have to be very careful that we don't violate people's individual civil liberties here in the United States um, by monitoring those communications or infringing on other rights, opening investigations without probable cause. That is a big one, and we don't do that. And so and a lot of people think, well, these agencies out there, they're just doing what they want, and that's just not true. They have oversight. They have uh, l lawyers within the agencies that have to approve almost everything that they do with regard to this stuff. They have to get warrants. So even with communication warrants, they have to get what are called FISA warrants, Foreign, foreign Intelligence Surveillance, or Surveillance Act warrants, to um, monitor those communications if you are suspected of being a terrorist. They can't just start listening in on your phone calls. They have to get a warrant to do that. How did counterterrorism develop after 9-11 in America? Well, we had to change the way we looked at overseas operations. Um, you know, we spent decades fighting the Soviet Union, okay, who were, we knew where they were, all right, um, and we knew how to find them. Uh, terrorists were different. They were in different places. They communicated differently. Um, they didn't stay in one place. So we had to modify how we combated terrorism. Um, we had to look at the potential for um, terrorists here in the United States. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with it without also um, isolating and alienating uh, an immigrant culture here in the United States? Okay, And so it was very difficult. And other countries have the same problem. Uh, other Western European, uh, well, Western European countries have a problem with engaging in uh, domestic counterterrorism without inflaming their immigrant population. Because you have to understand the terrorist is a very, very small minority of any population. I don't care what terrorist group it is. Right-wing terrorism, jihadi terrorism, they represent typically less than 1% of the population. So what you have to be careful of is make sure your policies don't infringe on the rest of the 99 point whatever percent and move them in the direction of being anti-government and pro-terrorist. What responsibility do you think social media companies and other managers of computer-mediated communications have in mitigating terrorism? Lee, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, it's a challenge because they're just, you can imagine the, I don't know, hundreds of millions, if not billions, of daily communications that go on in social media, Twitter, Facebook, and yes, they are in Facebook, uh, Instagram, and other platforms, uh, WhatsApp, and things like that. Uh, and how do they monitor these communications, especially when they're, they're t talking in code, okay? They're not just gonna go say, you know, let's go do this attack. They're gonna talk about, hey, how about we, um, you know, are, are you gonna be at the birthday party Friday? Okay, that kind of stuff, you know? So it, it's always challenging uh, to try to find out, even as an intelligence community, for, for the intelligence community to try to monitor all those communications like that, that might be suspicious, is challenging, and then to expect social media companies to do this, I, I mean, I think at some, on some point they should, okay, they should be looking for these communications and trying to shut them down, um, but I think it's going to take somebody actually suing, like after an attack, somebody suing one of these social media networks uh, or platforms uh, to say they are complicit, uh, to get some real action. I mean, they've, they've kind of taken action. Uh, and we've seen other groups like, and believe it or not, Anonymous, which is a hacker group, has actually gone in and shut down um, Twitter accounts for ISIS. Okay, hacked in and shut them down. Um, so, but that's what they do. You know, they, they are uh, very proactive in that regard. Uh, but it, it's going to take, I think, uh, sadly, uh, something bad to happen for them to really wake up and see that they have a responsibility here. Because what we see is after every major attack, especially a domestic attack. There's a social media presence prior to that attack that somebody could have seen, somebody should have seen, somebody should have thrown up a warning, and maybe that could have not happened. And that's, that's a counterfactual. You can't really say it wouldn't have, but at least we would have had an opportunity to try to stop it. 
How has the rise of social media and other computer mediated communications changed human trafficking operations? Oh my gosh, it's, it's it, the whole idea of social media and other communication, uh, not just human trafficking, but pretty much all transnational crime, okay? Uh, drug trafficking, all of it. Uh, it makes it so much easier for people to communicate, so much easier for people to acquire in the human trafficking realm, acquire um, the services of other human beings, okay? I've seen human trafficking advertisements on Instagram, Twitter, um, and that's how they do it now. So it's in the old days it was phone calls and face-to-face, -face, and now it's all done electronically. Uh, sadly, people can arrange um, to uh, meet their trafficking victim without ever talking to anybody. It can all be done electronically. So it has revolutionized that, I hate to call it an industry, but it really is. Uh, but at the same time, it has allowed law enforcement an opportunity to get a better handle on what's going on in the human trafficking realm and how to combat that. But again, we run up against that whole issue of civil liberties, okay? And what is, um, you know, criminal activity online and what isn't. And very often they, they kind of shroud this in, um, they call them escort services, okay? They don't say, you know, prostitutes, it's escort services. So they have to be very careful, but then it also allows law enforcement to engage in some pretty inventive sting operations uh, here locally in Polk County. Um, the Sheriff of Polk County does regularly online sting operations where they uh, capture uh, individuals who think they're online talking to uh, typically underage girls and will arrange to meet them at a hotel and when they show up they're immediately arrested for conspiracy to commit human trafficking. So uh, it's making it easier to find people. But again, it has in allowed the business to grow exponentially in the last few years. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we talk about it here at UCF uh, to try to create awareness so people understand uh, what they're dealing with and how to combat it. How has the emergence of social media changed the operation of terrorist groups around the world? Lee, it allows them to reach out to more people than they ever have been able to before. Typically, and in, in before social media, before the internet, um, if you wanted to communicate with your group, it either had to be face-to-face, -face, by phone, or through paper communications, pamphlets, things like that. And believe it or not, groups did send out like, almost like newsletters, okay, in the 60s and 70s. Um, today, all you have to do is send out a tweet, um, a Facebook post, uh, Instagram, uh, and some ISIS tweets uh, are shared hundreds of thousands of times. I mean, at one point they were sending out 100,000 tweets a day, okay? So what, what you see is they understand that, number one, their ability to at least throw it out there to be potentially exposed to hundreds of millions of people. Not that hundreds of millions of people are looking at it, but that is your potential audience. Throw it out there, and the cost is almost zero. And that's the real thing is it, it's, it's almost a, it's free advertising, okay? And so, yeah, it has revolutionized the terrorist communication environment. And it has allowed them to reach out to people that they wouldn't have been able to normally. So it's un hard to understand for me why somebody that is raised in the West, born in the West, raised in the West, can come to identify with a group in a foreign land that they've never been to, that they've never had any exposure to, um, only by watching things online. But the iterative effect of social media, the fact that you can communicate in real time with other individuals, makes that almost as uh, good and on par with face-to-face -face communications. So it is very transformative to some people. Okay, so we say, well, some people used to say, well, you can't be radicalized online. That's just not true. It can and does happen. How do the intelligence communities of America and the United Kingdom differ? That's a great question, too. I mean, I, I spent some time in the UK um, and working on some of this stuff, and their view of electronic communications is very different than ours. Um, when I was there, um, they were very concerned about um, jihadi communications. Uh, they actually have two terrorism acts that have outlawed the possession of any jihadi communication. Any, anything that glorifies jihad, okay, is outlawed. So if you're found to be in possession of those materials, 
you're in violation of the law. Okay, um, they're um, equivalent to our NSA, which is GCHQ, uh, made it clear that they are monitoring all electronic communications phone calls, text messages, emails, social media, everything to try to find terrorists within the UK. So where our intelligence community cannot do that, they do. Okay, so, um, and it got one, one time when, well, during the Olympics in London, um, most of the suspects, the people that they suspected were jihadis, um, they put like ankle bracelets on them to monitor their travel within the UK and they set, well, on a map, um, bubbles around the Olympic venues and said, do not go within these bubbles. And in one case, an individual was on a train that passed through the edge of one of those bubbles, and he was immediately arrested for violating that prescription uh, to not go within that bubble, even though he was on a train. So th they will monitor you, um, they, but interestingly, the laws there are very different too. Uh, you might be arrested on suspicion of uh, supporting a terrorist, which in the United States can get you 20 to 30 years in prison, and there you might spend a few months in prison until they figure out whether you're really active or not, and then they'll just let you go. So, uh, but people that are you know, engaged in terrorist operations, they go to jail for a very long time. Two years ago, we asked you what the most exciting developments were in counterterrorism. Do you feel like there are changes today? I do. We continue to change, and we, you know, as the terrorists change, we have to change. So it's it's kind of a the old adage, the cat and the mouse game. Uh, they change their strategy, we have to change our strategy. And when we change ours, they try to change theirs to counter our changes. And that seems kind of confusing, but it, it's always an evolution um, in counterterrorism. Uh, Communication-wise, we're trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, if they leave a, an online venue, where did they go? Um, Years ago, um, we had bin Laden's satellite phone number, and we were listening to his communications. Until sadly, somebody at the, at, well, I won't name the paper, uh, published the fact that our intelligence community was listening to bin Laden's phone calls and printed the number. At that point, he never used that phone again. Okay, So always we had to figure out how is he communicating. So today, that's one of the things we have to do, is figure out how are they communicating, what are they planning, um, you, you know, years ago we talked about how can we use all of this information to our advantage, kind of big data type stuff. And that's what we're doing now. We're looking at big data and trying to put that together in our counterterrorism operations. Also, um, utilizing social media. Uh, so before some of our operators might go into a village uh, or into a region in a country, um, we, we get a feel for um, that area through their social media traffic, through their electronic communications, so we can understand whether that village might be friendly toward Americans or unfriendly toward Americans, or whether they're harboring um, known extremists, okay? So it, it, it's allowing us a better view of the battlefield over there. Here it's, it's um, giving us an opportunity uh, when we have it to kind of triangulate on um, who we're dealing with and what kind of problems we're dealing with. And again, we're looking at a lot of different groups. Uh, believe it or not, there are groups here that uh, just hate our government. So, uh, and they're anti-cop, they're anti-government, uh, they kill police officers. So, you know, we're very concerned about that. Um, but yeah, our counterterrorism strategies are, continue to evolve and will continue to evolve as their strategies change. Well, Dr. Reynolds, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you today. We thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with us. If you want to learn more about today's guest, our mission, or our program, you can visit us at the PMBF website or follow any of our social media pages. For the Middle East and South Asia Studies program here at UCF, this is Lee Ajisafe. Thank you for listening.